for a weightlifter, if they don't snatch and clean and jerk well, well, their identity is now missing. So they're going to snatch and clean and jerk well, and they're going to do whatever it takes to do that. Crossfitters can get theirs in the gym in so many different ways. There's so more, in more places to hide as a crossfitter. Yeah. Yeah, but when you're taking your shirt off and you're wearing your hot pants, you can't hide, right? And so for them, it's like, I'm going to get my nutrition locked in. I'm not going to go party on the weekends. I am going to get enough sleep, you know? There's the recovery aspect that I really do feel like CrossFitters work on really, really hard compared to powerlifters or maybe maybe weightlifters. Talk to me about what your favorite pre-workout drink is. What's your pre-workout of choice? Uh, I, I love caffeine. So like, um, you know, there's, uh, do you know who Omar Isaf is? No. He's a, he's a, he's kind of, he's a YouTuber. Um, he actually does have a lot of good knowledge around um, fitness and, you know, strength and culture and stuff like that. And, uh, his product is called Ouroboros or Ouroboros. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's really like clean. It's, there's only like five ingredients, you know, it's like caffeine, creatine, uh, beta alanine, like the five core ingredients to a pre-workout. And it's only 200 milligrams of caffeine. Now you should try to take that half hour before training. Um, and then I, I like to have a relatively kind of empty stomach before I take my pre-workout. So I sometimes I will wake up um, and, you know, I might have like I, I always drink like a, a green drink uh, to get my greens in. And then I might just like take my pre-workout and go to the gym like without anything in my stomach. But if I'm going to train a little bit later, like say <clears throat> like 2, 3, 4 p.m., I'll have uh, oats or like some sort of carb and then I'll just chill for like two hours and then go. I will never really – sometimes I guess I'll have like scrambled eggs too because like for me it's really hard to get all of my protein in per day. So if I'm not eating protein for – you know, for the hours of the day or five hours a day. And then I go to the gym and I come back. Now I'm in this huge kind of hole where yeah. I have to gain back all it's the protein. A, it's a never ending treadmill of trying to eat it. Everyone that's listening, that's got a diet that requires them to have high volumes of protein in mine at the moment, my cows are like, I think 210, 210 grams of protein per day, which isn't yeah. like ridiculous, but I'd say it's like moderate, moderate high for someone who's mm -hmm. like in 80 kilos range. And, um, Fuck, man. Like, you're right. If you get to 2 yeah. p.m. and you've not had any protein yet, like, that's going to be the exactly. remainder of the day is going to suck bad. So, yeah. I mean, I do like to train an empty stomach, ideal world, you know, like, um, or having a big meal and then chilling, letting it all digest, and then going to the gym. I'm not a believer in like eating a pre workout meal. I don't like, I don't think that that's, I think that's kind of like bro sciencey type stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I just do caffeine. And then after, you know, I'm, I have to, you know, sometimes I want to get 250 to 270 grams of protein uh, because of my body weight. And like, I have to have two or three shakes, you know, a day just because I can't, I don't like eating that much like chicken breast and, and meat. Um, but I do actually notice the difference on high protein. Like I really, really do. Um, Recovery, and, mood. No, just fit, uh, physique wise. Like, I don't, I don't, and that's something that I don't really care too much about, but it's nice to have, you know, in, in, as a weightlifter, your, you know, your primary focus is to be healthy and in shape so that you can perform what you need to perform. It's not about aesthetics. Um, but I know that, that if your aesthetics are right, there's a chance that your body composition is right. And therefore you're maximizing, um, your weight class, or if that makes sense, you know, if you, you have too much body fat, you, it's too much weight for your weight class that is not usable. And so, um, something I've noticed on like a very high protein diet is that I can be a little bit more sloppy, if that makes sense in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the way that I eat, but that's a big stipulation. That's a big thing to do to try to get enough protein. Um, 
because if you want to get enough protein and eat poorly, it's not going to happen. You know, if you want to eat enough protein and go to, you know, McDonald's or Taco Bell, like you're going to get really fat or whatever, but eat enough protein, then you don't have to count uh, your macros as hard or, or be as diligent. Well, there's, there's um, no, there's no cheat meal that's high in protein. No one's no. like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm really, you know what? Ch- <laughs> Actually, uh, one that's really surprising and like this is one of my things about junk food and cheat meals is like i don't really like them unless they have high protein and at that point they end up having super high calories if that makes sense what like so so like uh chicken wings okay like chicken wings actually as far as like a cheat meal goes their the macros are fantastic high in protein relatively low in calorie compared to you know pizza like pizza legitimately has nothing in it but calories and fat (laughs) so those two being cheat meals are not the same in the same ballpark yeah in my opinion but you Um, you still get to relinquish your diet feel like you're not super restricted and you get like that that you tick that box you tick the i let my diet go a little bit box but in one version of the world, you've just put, what, maybe like 800 grams of carbs and another 150 grams of fat probably yes. into yourself with a pizza versus like, yeah. I don't know what with with uh, with chicken wings, but it's, it's stuff like that. Or a burger, right? A burger compared to a pizza. Those should not be in the same ballpark. Pizzas should be closer to ice cream, you know, um, but... Anyways, the, the, the main point being is that high protein is not easy, um, but it does help a lot, yeah. um, especially for someone like me where I'm constantly worried about my recovery, constantly worried. So like to just go in and do a bodybuilding workout, I don't want that to affect my mobility and my shoulders, um, my hips, knees, ankles, joints that need to be very, very loose um, and, and protected. I don't. I don't want to go into the gym and, and have to do bodybuilding, even though I love it. You know what I mean? Um, so it's nice to, ha- to be able to have, do a high protein diet and, and minimize uh, body fat like that. Yeah. And also given two versions of the world, given like one version, Zach makes weight for the competition and hits all of his lifts, gets nine white lights and all that stuff. And in another version of the world that happens, but with abs, it's like, I'll take the world that has abs. <laughs> well, it's, it- yeah, yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> although, uh, you know, it's never been about like lifting well and and performing well is always going to trump the way that I look. Um, but there's that. There's actually a famous track, a world famous track coach here at uh, in College Station, which is where I live. Uh, Texas A and M track coach, and it, he's like, at a certain point, you know, we have to look at body composition. Because if we're maximizing every bit of an athlete's potential, um, they need to have as much usable muscle as possible. And if you have extra fat, additional fat, that's that's space and that's weight, that's added weight to our sport, which is just speed. You know, it's all about who's the fastest, who can maintain the speed the longest, who's, you know, lightest, but also the most powerful. Mm. Um so yeah, it's body composition does matter, but it's a very fine line. I mean, I, I again, um, I never really used to think about I need protein, I need protein, but it really, really does make a difference when you start to eat like that. It's kind of like very similar to that bodybuilding type of lifestyle, that bro lifestyle. Mm, you have to. Um, there's no one who accidentally falls into a high protein diet either. You know, like no, right. no one just ends up going back through a year of macros, uh, which they weren't tracking, uh, which they weren't counting, but were tracking and goes, Oh, would you look at that? Like I just happens to my byproduct of my diet was 200 grams of protein. It's like, no, you have to go out of your way to force that down in one form. Yeah. I think the suggested for someone who's 80 kilos is what 140 program uh, protein. That's super easy, but you know, we're looking for you. If you're, you know, you're trying to build, muscle or whatever you might go all the way up to 250 um and so yeah it's just not possible yeah so we've touched on a number of different categories of strength athletes or endurance athlete whatever it is i thought that it might be fun today for me and you to go through some of the (laughs) stereotypes of 
different lifters and different athletes that we see in the gym or that we see online and stuff like that. So to hold my hands up for the different teams that I'm on, I probably came into the world as a bro lifter. Actually, originally before that, a cricketer, which is like the British version of uh, of baseball, I guess. Right. Um, And then bro lifter, bodybuilder, little bit of sort of Muay Thai and boxing and stuff, and then now CrossFit. What's your what's your heritage in um, strength and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, f- it was for football, for American football. Um, was the first time I was introduced to the weight room. I was about 13 or 14, uh, and it was just all bro stuff. And then when, when I was actually on a program, we would do c- big compound movements, squats, bench, uh, pull-ups. Um, you know, it was actually interesting. I, I couldn't. I could probably do like maybe one or two pull-ups when I graduated high school. So I was 18 years old. Uh, I was just so long and, you know, limmy. Didn't have, yeah, just very limmy. And um, then I got to college and I was playing uh, lacrosse at the university, uh, University of Vermont. And we had a very structured weightlifting program um, or like weight program. And, you know, we would go four times a week. And that's where like my strength coach was basically like, Oh, you can't do a pull up. You're going to do them every day, you know, every day, at least when you come in here, when you're fresh, just try to get, you know, whatever you can. Uh, and by the end of that, I think I got like 15 and I, that was the biggest difference in like my physique that I've ever noticed outside of actually my legs from squatting too. Mm. Um, we would squat two, three times a week and that was noticeable as well. So that was my big exposure to training. And then when I graduated college, I felt that I still had a lot of, uh, I still had a lot of ability remaining. So, you know, I didn't know how to, lacrosse was done for me. Um, So like pretty much all sports, like official sports that I used to partake in, like American football, basketball, lacrosse, like, you know, I could have done like house leagues or things like that. But um, I wanted to get, I wanted to stay very intense and train really hard. And I actually, I, I saw an article, it might have been on like Men's Journal or something, and it was on uh, Rich Froning. Uh, you know, it might, not, it might not have even been on Rich Froning, but it was about Murph, the workout Murph, and uh, which is a, you know, a, a staple in CrossFit these days. Um, and I remember being like, wow, that's what a weird way of thinking of training, you know, here's a bunch of reps, do them as fast as you can. Um, and there are, there are things that like, you know, push ups, pull ups, squats, those are things that I've only ever done in sets of 10 and, uh, you know, with rest and on a program. And I was like, that sounds really, really cool. So I went into a gym, a CrossFit gym, uh, I, and then I fell in love with it there. And then um, I got really just more and more sucked into it. I wanted to coach more people. I wanted to help out. So I got my level one. Uh, and then I got my USA weightlifting uh, certification. So USA W uh, level one certification. And then I was lucky enough to get a, a full-time coaching job. Um, as a CrossFitter or as a CrossFit coach, which in in America or anywhere really full time, like getting a, a wage to be a CrossFit coach is is a pretty good deal. And um, I think a lot of my development as a coach to that job. Uh, but then after a while, I kind of I didn't want to work with kind of your average Joes anymore. And that wasn't the main reasoning behind that was. I was tired of, of people teaching people and giving my all, teaching them how to snatch and clean and jerk and do all these movements to have them just want to look better. You know, I really wanted performance. And so what I did was I went back to the collegiate strength and conditioning field. I was an intern for free, which is crazy. That's one of the things that you have to do when you want to be a strength coach at least in America is that you have to intern. And that means it's pretty much a volunteer position Um, I was doing that for seven or eight months and then I got another job in Texas A&M, which is here in college station. 
Uh, and, and since then, since that point, I've fallen back into weightlifting throughout all of that, that whole thing where I graduated college to now, um, I've been weightlifting in and out of being involved in CrossFit. And I'd say the last two and a half, three years have been like pure weightlifting. Um, but I have, you know, I've been coaching weightlifting. I've been coaching the lifts. I've been competing in weightlifting since 2013. So that's kind of the broad picture of my training. 30,000 foot view of your athletic yeah. background. It's so funny yeah. about the, um, when you want to go and do something that is focused on finding the best people or getting to the toward the top or the peak of people's performance i'm reminded of uh, ryan holiday do you know how he started his writing career out so he went and assisted robert green five times new york times best-selling author mastery yeah. 48 laws of power all that stuff and previous modern wisdom guest hey. um he went and assisted him for free as a yeah. research a research assistant and you know you've got robert green writing these huge books drawing on 3,000 years worth of history and oh, Ryan I need to find out about where Julius Caesar's this this thing happened can you fuck off to the library and go and sort it for me and um, he just did that but then you get coming out the other side of that you get this ridiculous experience and that presumably yeah. is the same for you getting to work at a such an incredible level and then you can distill that back down yeah like uh working at collegiate strength and conditioning and I know that you like there, I'm sure there's a lot of Americans that listen, but if you're, you know, European or elsewhere in the world, like it is a big, big deal uh, in America, especially at a place like Texas A&M, which is a 60,000 student university, 60,000 students undergrad, like that's the, the level and the amount of money that comes into this, to, to sporting here is like, it's something you would compare to uh, a major football club in uh, the English premier league. Like it's, it's seriously that intense. Our stadium right over there, it houses a hundred, 110,000 fans. So when you go see one of those uh, games, that is insane. Yeah. So a lot of people want to be strength coaches <clears throat> because they have, there are these, these really prominent uh, programs. And so it's a very saturated market, but the process is, you know, you have to be an intern. You have to build your way up and then Earn hopefully... Your stripes, kind of. Yes. And uh, that is, for the most part, at least my experience, it was for free. What I did, I, I felt like, you know, I was competing in weightlifting, you know, in and out. And then I, I had like what you would call like a fellowship program at Texas A&M where I was actually being paid and it was kind of nice. Um, once that finished up, I kind of wanted to just take a break and and focus on weightlifting and and trying to be a better and maybe going into private. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life, um, but I knew that the the lineage that it seemed very bureaucratic to to be involved in something like like that, you know. And I I feel like I'm maybe more of a creative person than it, it just might not have been the best fit for me. Um, and so I remember my next job after that, because I, I needed to make money, was uh, a personal trainer at a Gold's Gym. And it was I actually... Loved, I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. And it was actually uh, not a bad gig, man. Like, it really was... It was pretty cool. And there was actually some pretty knowledgeable people there um, and making good money. And for me, it wasn't a means... It, 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 was, it wasn't like oh, I'm going to be a, a Gold's Gym personal trainer for the rest of my life. You know, I'm going to figure out the next step. But right now it's pretty good. You know, I, I'm in a cheaper place, a cheaper uh, cost of living area. Um, a lot of stuff is going good in my life. So someone actually mentioned like, hey, you should check out YouTube for uh, like putting your stuff on YouTube. And so... I didn't really know what the purpose of YouTube was. Like I, I literally thought it was just a place where you could like send links to other people. Like you would just send, you know, and watch. I didn't know that people had channels where they would kind of use it as this social outlet. Uh, it wasn't like a community type thing. And then when this person showed me, like they showed me Casey Neistat, they showed me um, some of like the bigger names, like, God, I can't, uh, David Dobrik and stuff like that. I was like, wow, this is, 
this yeah. culture is crazy. Like I, I had no idea, you know, it's like I, I felt like I was blind to it. I just wasn't paying attention or something like that. So I would just consume that content all the time. Then I, I made, uh, some videos around my training for CrossFit. And I remember like, cause I, 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 I when I went to school, I was a film and television studies major and then like a, a business minor. And I remember like being really, really into editing and like loving film production. That's why I wanted to do it. So when I made these vlogs of my training for CrossFit, CrossFit, it was like, it would take me a long time. I would, I would make these like really serious edits and then I would put them on YouTube and no one would watch them. And I remember I posted one to a CrossFit page, uh, or the CrossFit Reddit page, and some guy was like, "Listen, you're not that, you're not that good looking, <laughs> you're not that good at CrossFit, right? And you're not telling us like anything about your story, or and you don't have any expertise." And I was like, "Well, first off, I'm not that bad looking, okay? <laughs> no, um, but." No, I, I, you know, I took that, I was like, kind of like, you know, fuck this guy. He doesn't know anything. But then also I was like, well, that's true. At, at, my videos were all very surface level, just had nothing to them. Mm. I think it was because I was trying to cater to what Casey Neistat had already established himself as. You know, people were involved in his story before the content that I saw. People were not involved in my story. People don't know who the fuck I am. So one thing the guy said is like, do you have any expertise? And I said, hell yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of expertise in weightlifting. So my next video, I completely revamped. I was like, you know what? I see this issue in the snatch. Uh, and here's how you fix it. Um, uh, here's the issue being played out. And I'll show an example. Here's what it should look like. And here are the drills you can do to fix it. Thank you guys for watching. Boom, send it out. I deleted my other YouTube vlogs. I clicked the link to this, copy pasted, put it put it on Reddit uh, weightlifting, and they loved it. Everyone in that in in the Reddit community was like, "This is awesome, man! Keep doing it." Um, and so I, I basically was like, "Okay, I'll do another one next week because I have another idea." And that one did well. And I've just repeated that for now two and a half, three years. And I've got 103,000 subscribers. And it it was really interesting how that all played out. It was like, it seemed so intuitive and so natural to just put what you know out there. And if someone likes it somewhere, there's a chance that maybe someone else might like it and it might snowball from there. But you can't give yourself the benefit of the doubt if you try to do something that you're not or if you try to do what other people are doing. Man, I, so, I have been talking about this a lot recently, which is your weirdness is your superpower. So the unique offering that you have to put out or that I have to put out or anybody that's listening has, that is your USP because no one, literally no one else on the planet, even a twin brother or a twin sister has precisely the same mix of life experiences and interests and talents and proclivities and background and story and all the rest of it. No one, nobody else has that. So when you see people that are prepared to dilute down their unique individual offering, or as you say, kind of, perhaps aim for or align themselves with some externalized idea of what they should be doing. Oh, well, this is what the other guys are doing. Maybe I'll just try and do a carbon copy of that. And maybe that is you. If that's your true, like you speaking your truth forward, then great. If you are just like a miniature Casey Neistat, then fucking fun, like great for you. Yeah. Um, but if you're not, you're losing out on the opportunity to really break it through. And you hit the nail on the head there. If you find it interesting... You have to presume, like you're not an alien, I don't think you are, an alien from out of space. You know, like if you find it interesting, the like, there has to be at least a couple of other people out there that find right. it interesting. And therefore that might roll even further forward. And that's, yeah. you know, part of my- That was my mindset. And that was actually what has provided me with the most amount of success is that the organic growth from when I started to now has been amazing. 
you know, I had at one point I had 20,000 subscribers and I was getting 20,000 views. It was like <laughs> for, anyone who, anyone who's got a YouTube channel that is that's stupid. Yeah. Because it was a lot of people weren't subscribing so I would get a lot of clicks from elsewhere but it was like the people who were following me, the people who wanted to listen to me, I was putting it directly at them and I was not backing down. I was not changing at all. Um and it just it kept working and I you know um I would put in so much goddamn time on these videos and I loved every second of it. I would sit down and edit for 40 hours. Like like straight up I would do, you know, 12 hours one day and then I would do like 6 hours the next and it would it would just be like till like 3 in the morning. I just didn't care. It was so awesome cuz then when I got to click upload and I could see people view and comment and talk about it. It was like, man, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing something with my life. Mm. Um, and I was not prepared to let that slip at all. And people, when I started it, I was like, yeah, you know, I've got, uh, like a thousand subscribers and people are like, Oh, that's cool. But it's like, what is that? Mm-hmm. YouTube subscribers? What does that even mean? Mm. You know, like my parents were like, okay, well you brought, you probably should like get a career going. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. Like that's that. nice. Zach. Yeah. And, and, you know, now it's like, okay, when you look at what marketing agencies want, I actually, when I graduated, I got a job in advertising right away. And the value of 103,000 subscriptions and the value of all of these things of this consumption of your media is so huge. It's so it it cannot be understated how valuable that is in today's society. And yet when people are starting to try and build something of value like that, they're like, hey, you're being an idiot. Go do a real job. Like, how are we still in that realm of people discouraging people from doing creative shit when the, it's the creative shit that actually provides the most value? Right. I mean, like, like. Um, I I have a video with uh, three million views on Lu Zhao Jun. Okay, my favorite, my favorite video of yours, man. Right, and that three million views, like, what cable, what cable television show can knock out three million views on just a regular show? They right. fucking can't. And how much money do they spend to do that? Man, have you seen? It's very recent. Eric Weinstein on Joe Rogan, the most yeah. recent one. Yep, most, yeah, most most recent one. So he, I, hits. I, only, I only like I, what I do is I look at the clips, but I I, I liked some of the stuff that. So he you was may saying, have yeah. watched the clip of the bit that I'm about to talk about now, but it's where he talks about traditional media versus mainstream media. No, I haven't seen that. No, oh, dude, you got to go find it because it, you would absolutely love it. So basically, uh, Eric Weinstein, for people who don't know who he is, this absolute freak genius polymath guy who is on Rogan all the time, super clever mathematician, managing director at Teal Capital, like Peter Teal, PayPal Mafia guy. Anyway, huge penis, massive, massive, massive dick guy. <laughs> and um, and um, he is talking to Joe Rogan about the problem of when two different worlds collide. And he's talking about kind of this new world, which is the Joe Rogans, the, the Zach Thielanders, the modern wisdoms of the world, kind of the, the subculture of internet stuff. Uh, when it clashes with the older world, the ABC, the NBC, the BBC, the ITV stuff in the UK. And um, what he says is, Rogan brings up this brilliant point where he said, people talk about mainstream media and they use that as a signal that this is the media that has the most credibility. It's the one that has the best experts. It's it's, It's the one. And everything else is like a guy in his bedroom doing a thing which you know I, yeah. I don't have a massive amount of um ability <laughs> to complain about but um and the argument that gets made by eric is perfect and he says well hang on a second like if you put this podcast out and this podcast gets five million views yeah i mean and, simple math and yeah. five five million views not only five million views but five million views multiplied by probably I'd, i wouldn't like to guess what the average watch time on rogan's channel is but it'll be like probably 30 minutes, maybe more, maybe like 40, 45 minutes probably or something. Some ridic- So the watch time, the total watch time- Yeah, that's the real value. Yeah, will be freakish. Time. Like the time under tension that people are spending watching. Ro- so he's like, well, hang on a second. If I get more watch time on this channel, 
than ABC, NBC, ITV, BBC. Who's mainstream media? Yeah, right? exactly. Who is mainstream media now? There's traditional media. Traditional media is that. Mainstream media, I don't think so. And I agree. Right. And um, when Joe had the epidemiologist on his show, mm -hmm. um, when, it was about four weeks ago uh, when the coronavirus scare was beginning. That's where I got all of my information. That's where I got everything was the professional epidemiologist who was as clear cut and as dry as it could possibly be. There was zero entertainment value. None of it. There was no editing. It was a guy in a room talking to another guy about what the fuck is happening. That to me was like, oh, finally. Thank you. Thank you. After this disease or this virus has been out in, in China and it was, dude, it was going on in January. And I remember people being like, there were some memes being made. And then, then, then it was like, ah, fuck it. You know, it's in Wuhan. No one really cares. You know, like I remember that we, I had practice, I mean, weightlifting practice. Um, and all of my, my lifters are students at Texas A&M. You know, they're college kids. They weren't even giving a shit. No one gave a shit about this thing. And it was mainly because no one knew anything. Like, you, we could have figured this out. Like, we could have just been more informed earlier on. And um, what was amazing was I still wasn't informed at all. Uh, I, had a sem I had two seminars. One of them was going to be last week in Maine. So I would have had to take out a flight. There's mm -hmm. no way in hell. Yeah. Um, but when I saw this epidemiologist, or I think it was like a virologist, like a vir I think. Vir yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I saw him, it was super clear cut, super dry. It told me exactly what I need to know. Mm. What's probably going to happen. You know, we why this is so bad. We're fucked all this stuff. And it, it, he told me, and it was good instead of Donald Trump being like, you know, we're, we have the most tremendous scientists, you know, everything's the best We're, you know, it's not a big deal. Like, so, just tell us, just tell us what the fuck is going on and I'll be on my way. Well, here's and the thing. Here's the thing as well about the main, mainstream media. I'm going to reprogram myself to say like the traditional media. The thing right. about traditional media, when they have these panel shows, um, first off, it's, it's a cliche now to talk about, you know, you get your 30 second spot and you're trying to get a zinger in. So it's a good YouTube video. Like that's old. What I think is more interesting is people presume that a large lineup of guests equals a high amount of value. It's like, oh, well, look at this. They've got Ben Affleck and Sam Harris on the same show, and it's Bill Mayer's show. Or they've got this guy, he's a virologist, and this woman, she's public health official, and this guy. And you're like, right, I know that sounds great. That sounds fantastic. But it's the, it's the girl who has played hard to get for ages with big titties that doesn't care about having sex with you. It's like all of the stuff, all of the headlines sound fantastic, but the actual performance and what you get out of it is completely terrible. Yeah. Yes. It's um, it's always been when we've privatized uh, something that shouldn't be privatized. So we have privatized media or, or we've privatized news. That makes zero sense. News is public. That's the definition of it. It's delivering events, things that have happened ways to protect yourself, all of these different things. And we've privatized that. So people make money. So you can, there was a, I just saw this goddamn um, clip, man. <laughs> and this woman was like, we're working on a vaccine. Um, we're working on a vaccine. So we go to this company and it's like, this is like ABC, right? Working on a vaccine. And then they talk to the, the lead scientist of this vaccine. And they're like, we talked to the lead scientist who's making this vaccine on the floor. And then the person's like, yeah, we're ready to like make the vaccine. And they're like, and back to you. It was like, I'm not even kidding you. 10 seconds. I was like, are you kidding me? I would have sat there and listened to this person talk for 30 minutes. I'm not allowed to leave my fucking house. And you guys are still making four minute long clips where the the lead scientist making a vaccination that could save millions of lives is now being fucking pigeonholed into a 10 second bit 
so you can try and get more views like that. Why are we in that world? It's there's it's no wonder why people give a, more of a shit about Joe Rogan where he sits down with guys for three hours and he's like, huh, interesting. You know, like I, I just remember being f- absolutely floored after that, you it's, know, and it's, it's the same old song and dance. It happens every time. As bad as it is, the advantage for as long as that game continues to be played by traditional media, there is a gap in the market for people like me, people like you, people yeah. like Rogan, people like Eric Weinstein, you know, because it's not being serviced. And the fact, it's like the stats, again, it's cliche to say, but I think podcast stats essentially double. It's like the uh, Moore's Law. Like every two years, they're doubling the the total number of global listens. Yeah. Um, and some unbelievable, it's like more than 50% of Americans are now subscribed to a podcast. Now, that doesn't mean they necessarily listen every week, but that's like, fuck it. Like there's not more than 50% of Americans that do pretty much anything. Anything, yeah. Yeah. You know? Like there's nothing that unites you. You can't even get fifty percent of the country to vote together. Like, well, it's it's when when social media becomes media. You know, it's like um, having a YouTube channel is becoming more and more social media. Like having a YouTube channel and getting people to watch is very different than having an Instagram and getting people to 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 follow. Um, but those sort of things are more are blending more and more together. If you have a podcast, there's a chance that you'll have a YouTube channel and there's a chance that you'll be able to clip up some of those YouTube channel podcast clips and throw them on your Instagram. So the more and more connected it is. Um, and the, and the more and more people are going to consume that style of media rather than your typical ABC. But if to bring it back to, to powerlifting, weightlifting, bodybuilding, uh, you know, all different forms of fitness there. I imagine that the, the viewership for those things is doubling the viewership and the listening to all of those things is doubling as well. Um, there is definitely, definitely a lot more room for legitimate sources of information around fitness. And I think there always will be people think it's getting too saturated. It's not, it's when a a certain trend kicks off and then other people just latch on to that trend. Right. Um, I think Jeff Nippard pulling in uh, scientific examples of why things work and trying to lay them out in simplistic ways, like that is becoming a more saturated style of delivering content, even though it's not wrong. Um, and if you do it, you're not really, it, it, it all depends on the person who's delivering. Mm-hmm. If I say, Hey, you know, um, Jeff Nippert's doing this. I want to do it. Well, then that's probably the wrong approach. But if I say, here's something that I'm really passionate about and here's someone who does it pretty well, I think I'm going to try to do a little bit what they do, use a little bit of influence. I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's always room for more information around fitness. I mean, look at where we are from when you started and when I started weightlifting and, and just going to the gym. Look at the the knowledge that the average gym goer has compared to then. Well, you don't have to, you're not trolling through bodybuilding.com forums. That's uh, what I used to do, man. T Nation articles. That is is literally what I used to do. I mean, I was around um, when dial up internet was a thing. You know what I mean? I was, and and for me. Kids these days will never know, Zach, man. Kids these days will never know. Yeah, You're fucking and, Craig Ritchie and Sonny Webster giving you free fucking workouts all the time. Yeah. Get some of the best information on the planet available, free streaming in full HD, VR, 3D bullshit. Like it's that. it's actually crazy, man. Like I can, you know, if someone wants to learn to snatch and clean a jerk, like they can go online and fucking do it. And that is crazy. If I want to go and learn how to surf, if I want to do anything, I can do it. It's uh, it's amazing. It also, people are still too lazy sometimes to do that. You know, you'll go to a globo gym and you'll see someone squatting with shit form and it'll be amazing to you that someone will be squatting with such shit form or shit technique. Um, and they'll be adding more and more weight and they'll be just lifting like a general jackass when we do have all of these awesome, you know, sources of information. So a lot of times it's more of like a human condition. Like, yes, 
the information is getting better. It's better and better and better. But a lot of times humans are lazy sacks of shit. Path of so, least resistance, man. It always right. is. So look, let's let's get into it, right? Let's start because I've got a power lifter who's one of the the guys that comes on and co-hosts now and then, Johnny. Uh, definitely, there is a disproportionate number of powerlifters who are also accountants. One hundred percent. That is try, weird. Try and tell me otherwise. That's super weird. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I've never. I've never met. I don't think I've met a powerlifter that's an accountant as no. well. Oh man, they love spreadsheets. You know, everything's color yeah, coded. That's actually true. I mean, that, now that I think about the the powerlifting coach that I know uh, who owns my gym. Uh, when we had a gym, uh, the good old days, his <laughs> program is insanely, it's, it's like so deep, you know, it's got beautiful pages of spreadsheets, color coded, yep. all that, all that jazz. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. So powerlifters, powerlifters, are, a lot of them are accountants. I think weightlifters, in my experience, weightlifters are kind of like, they're a little bit like the arty kid in school. Like yeah. they probably they probably did like music probably did music I reckon going through school perhaps did maybe even like a little bit of you know like dance or something. I mean, look, you're you want to see how right you are? <laughs> look at this. There's my guitar down there, <laughs> and there's my drum set right here. Man, I got it. I got it. I'm telling you. Yeah. No. Okay. So so the powerlifters are definitely the kids who got. A's in math yep. and uh, are very hardworking. Dude. I think there's another there's another wing of the powerlifters, and they are the kids that listen to Slipknot, Metallica, <laughs> like a lot of heavy metal. Um, as uh, what's yourself the the guy that does the um, bro science uh, YouTube channel? I can't remember his name, but he says uh, they were the kids at the back of the class that were playing buddy, bloody knuckles and piercing themselves with safety pins. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh dom mazzetti yeah dom, dom mazzetti, mazzetti yeah. yeah that's him and he's uh, yeah. playing bloody knuckles at the back of the class piercing themselves yep. with safety pins like there are the, there are those two those are the two main camps i think yeah so they would be meatheads and nerds yeah yeah but both yeah. both of whom have realized that if they lift tons of weights it's it's kind of impressive yeah like Kind of, yeah, I know what you're saying. And then I'd say weightlifters are more inclined to be kind of artsy, I guess, too. If we're gonna if we're gonna group them into like click clicky type things or, or groups in high school, I would say um, it's hard. To, it's hard because you could say that CrossFitters, there's a group of them that are kind of nerdy, hard workers, mm -hmm. but they also some CrossFitters like. I feel like some of the CrossFit girls could be the like attractive girl who was also had a 4.0 and was a part of a bunch of different clubs. Oh yeah, they're the, they're you know the what I mean? high like, super goody a number of, of of domains, yeah. But there's also yeah. there is also a huge huge subculture of CrossFit girls who have realized that they can wear hot pants year round if they do CrossFit. Yes. They're like, look, are you, yeah. hang on. I usually get shouted at off my mum when I walk out wearing those shorts, but you're telling me that I can do that an hour a day, five days a week in this gym? Are you being serious? Uh, yeah. You are, you, oh, that, that's absolutely fine. And a bra? Wow. Like, you know, that's, and you, you know who you are. Okay. You know who you are, girls. Yeah. I think, you know, something I'm always thinking about is like, the things, the recovery, I think that CrossFitters are, it's much more a part of their culture to focus on recovery at all levels and focus on nutrition at all levels. If you're like really, really into it. Um, because there are so many different movements. I feel like the training is like when you go to the gym there's so many different movements, so you can't necessarily train uh, or control the way that you move and everything. And so it's almost uh, a release. It, it's like a relief of pressure, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like if if for a weightlifter, if they don't snatch and clean and jerk well, well, their identity is now missing. So they're going to snatch and clean and jerk well, and they're going to do whatever it takes to do that. Crossfitters can get theirs in the gym. They can get theirs in the gym it, in so many different ways. There's so more, in, more places to hide as a crossfitter. Yeah, yeah, but when you're 
when you're taking your shirt off and you're wearing your hot pants, you can't hide, right? And so for them, it's like, I'm going to get my nutrition locked in. I'm not going to go party on the weekends. I am going to get enough sleep, you know? There's the recovery aspect that I think across I, – I really do feel like rec- CrossFitters work on really, really, really hard compared to powerlifters or maybe maybe weightlifters. There's, an, there's another one actually as well. I don't know so much about weightlifters because I've not watched the sessions quite so closely, but I know for an absolute fact that powerlifting – has to be the least time efficient sport to train in. Yeah. Ever known. Well, that is true, but it's mainly again, that's a path of least resistance. There if you you watch powerlifters, they so weightlifters, we sit down a lot when we're training. <laughs> but at the same time, the relative loads that we're lifting are nowhere near as high as powerlifters. Mm-hmm. So we can get up and go lift again. Like we, you know, sometimes you start having conversations and not losing focus, but power lifters, it's like they just killed themselves in their last set. So they're going to rest. And then that rest turns into something that's like 10 minutes long. A lot of phone use. Yes. Choosing the next track. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think though, weightlifters do that quite a bit. And every once in a while when I'm coaching, I have to get on my weightlifters asses to be like, Hey, we're training now, like, let's go, you know. That's, that's one of the things, especially uh, to fly the flag, at least in part for CrossFit, because we're just we're just kind of bashing everyone at the moment. Um, to fly the flag, at least in part for CrossFit, I like the fact that it is a part of your day where your phone is left in your bag. You know, you, can, you yeah. get your whiteboard out, you write your workout out on your whiteboard, phone goes in bag, there's a clock on the wall, that's it, done. But especially as a weightlifter, because of the requirement now, this 21st century requirement with weightlifters and powerlifters, especially those that are getting remote coaching, to video every one of their lifts. And then they go over, they take the phone off the little Joby grip that's attached to the rig on the far side. They watch the video back. Then they choose the next track. Then they get sucked into Instagram. Oh, I'll put an Instagram story up. I'll do yep. this, that, and the other. You know, yep. it's vicious, vicious cycle. It's, uh, yeah, that... When I coach my guys, it's kind of a thing where I just, they don't, they're not allowed to have their cell phones out. So, um, and that just, everyone's focused on each other, focus on themselves, focus on the barbell. And then, you know, you can, when we go to do accessories, you can bring your phone and chat and stuff. I don't care too much, but, um, for the most part, I try to limit the phone usage completely during practice times um because it's not helping anyone you know it's not even helping you if they want video of something like yeah that's that's fine you know if someone wants a video but for the most part people wouldn't even abuse it anyways because it's like kind of like it's a social event like you want to be there with your team you want to watch other people lift you want to kind of cheer them on and stuff like that Mm. um but you know i i actually was just talking about this yesterday Uh, i don't know if do you know who michelle latondra is no So she was a a games athlete. I think she's been to six games and now she's a coach and she's coached. She coaches uh, Patrick Vellner. She coached Laura Horvath. Um, She's, she's a really, really smart person and um, generally awesome. And we were talking about the differences when she was a CrossFitter and then when she went to compete in weightlifting and she remembers feeling a lot better when she was lifting heavy while she was a CrossFitter. Um, which is interesting. And I, I think I know why. And that's because CrossFitters have that they can alleviate the pressure from a certain lift, their fear of snatching heavy or clean and jerking heavy and fa- fear of failure. Or any of that is just not there. Why? Even when they switch, because it's, it's embedded in their sport. Why would you care about a maximum snatch when you have 13 other things that you have to do? Like, yeah, you want to do the best you can, but this is not your identity. This is not who you are. And when they switch to competitive weightlifting, that still stays with them. They're like, oh, it's my first meet. I'm just going to have fun. Oh, it's my second meet. You know, this, I've only done weightlifting for officially for a year now. And I just keep PRing and all that stuff. <laughs> and, and that's a great, great mentality because they're basically, they're forgetting the things that aren't, Um, that are outside of their control they're they're completely taking them out uh of you know out of the situation 
And um, a lot of weightlifters lose sight of that when they start training. And so there's, there's this line and we talk about this a lot. Me and my coach Max is, is having this line of expectations and standards. So if you expect a lot, right. And you have decently high standards, it's not always the best having low expectations, but incredibly high standards is usually going to bid you the best result for the most of the, for, for most of the time especially when you're training. It's challenging so, when, when you're passionate about something, right? You know, like you want to do well. You want to do yes. well. Everyone that's listening, that's, that's But driven. expectations, the word itself, expect. Why do we go about life expecting anything? Expect? Like that's a stupid word. That's silly. You're not, you, nothing is deserved. Nothing is expected. You just have to do the best you can and do better than you did before and at least try to do better. I think that is the only expectation is that you will give your best effort. When you expect a certain result, you either get that result and there you go. Your life is over or you get below that result and everything sucks. Mm. Either way, everything sucks, right? It's being process oriented versus goal oriented. Okay, but what we were talking about, a very interesting aspect is that the best, the elite, 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 like the Matt Frasers or the Michael Phelps, those are the ones that have high expectations and high standards, and they don't always have the the best mental health because of it. Couldn't agree more, man. There's a bunch of people who I think aren't happy. I actually think Matt Fraser is. I think he has. He's just built to be a high performer. Um But a lot of the time, there's a price that you need to pay. I did a video on this recently uh, talking about you can't just take part of someone's life. You have to take the whole. So people look at Elon Musk or fucking um, Matt Fraser, for instance, or, you know, Tiger Woods, amazing example, actually, Tiger Woods. Like you look at Tiger Woods 20 years ago and you go, oh, my God, this guy's like worth millions of dollars, sponsored by Nike, best golfer on the planet, child prodigy, this, that, and the other. But if you find out about tiger especially if you read um uh, stillness is the key by ryan holiday he's got some amazing research in that about tiger and that his dad his dad abused him as a child in golf like it was golf abuse but it was absolutely 100 percent, especially in today's society would be considered abuse he even had a safe word they had a safe word tiger woods and his dad had a safe word and the safe word was enough and he never once said it. They called Damn. it, they referred to it as the E word. That, that makes, crazy. makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I man. know, yeah. The, the yeah. E word. They had a safe word for when Tiger was like, dad, you, Getting- you push, you're pushing me too hard here. And like he used to say, like he used to call him, he used to call his own son the N word. He was like, this is why you're a useless N. This is why this, this is why that. Like, and you think, okay, you see Tiger Woods, you see the product at the end of this. You don't realize what he's had to sacrifice, all of the things, that the baggage that he carries with him that go along with that. I remember in Chasing Excellence by Ben Bergeron, there's this story about Matt Fraser. He used to be, I think, an engineer, mechanical engineer. Yeah, we went to the same college. No way. Yeah. That's cool. University. University. That's how, yeah, that's what people in the UK call it university, right? Yes, correct. As opposed, I mean, it, it is a university, but in America, we we can say anything is a college, but yes, go on. Um, And there was a story he was revising at night uh, for his engineering exam thing. And uh, he wasn't letting himself leave the library until he could recite this entire chapter verbatim. And then he would get toward the end and would mess up. And then he'd go, right, just start again. It was like 5 a.m. And he finally did it and let himself leave. And you think like, the byproduct of that is you have someone who is so particular about the performance, so incredibly um, precise with what it is that they want. But what's the price that you have to pay for that? Like, yeah. can Matt Fraser ever go to bed without the room being made or without putting his shorts away? Or can he ever go on holiday without having a minute by minute plan? I, I don't know if these are particular examples and they're obviously not existential threats, but you can imagine if you start to create more of a pathological, uh, psychological profile of that, there can be some, some fairly painful side effects that come with this. Yeah, it's, um, 
the the whole wanting to like I think if you want to do better and you want to improve, low expectations, high standards. If you want to be the absolute best, you have to almost tease yourself. You almost have to make fun of yourself. You have to make yourself depressed. You have to make yourself sad. You have to make yourself fearful. You have to make yourself scared. Those are not good health qualities. You should never do that if you want to live a healthy, safe, happy life, right? But that's not what these people want. They want to fucking win. That's like, I would never ever say to Matt Fraser, you know, low ex, well, low expectations, high standards. But I would say to 99.9% of everyone in the world who wants to improve at what they're doing, low expectations, high standards. They're wanting to win is like a curse. It's like a horrible, horrible thing. And sometimes you'll see a, an, an athlete who's actually so naturally gifted that they won't even need to have that toxic of a mindset. And that's about the rarest of rare. You know who I think might have that? Patrick Vellner. Upon looking from the outside in, I think he, he may do. Well, you know, again, you could never, ever know because you're not in Patrick Vellner's brain. It's like we we don't even know. We don't know the first thing about Matt Fraser. We don't live with him. We don't you know, it's like we don't know anyone. No one knows anyone's story or the, the encounters that they have. You can only judge them based off of what? what Nothing. they choose to tell you. Yeah. And even then, it's like it's not even a fraction. It's a. It's a blink of what they actually are as a human and what they, you know, they can tell you these things in interviews. And I'm not saying that these people are hiding bad things. I'm saying this because I would hope that no one would judge me for who I am or the type of person I am um, or say that, you know, you know, Zach isn't struggling or he is struggling. They wouldn't be able to tell those things based off of the tiny little blip of information they're given. Mm. I, on the outside, yeah, you know, it does look like Patrick Vellner looks like the type of guy who is just excels and has a good mentality, but you don't know the torment that he gives himself before he goes to sleep. Yeah, that's it. Man. And it's that's, things like that. That's what, you know? that's, that's what the, the ultimate leveler, I think, for everyone. And this, I use this example with Elon Musk a lot. It's like everyone thinks Elon Musk, unbelievable, PayPal mafia, Tesla, sending fucking people to Mars. We're going to colonize the planet. We're going to do all this sort of stuff. I'd love to be him. He's just this super genius polymath with billions of dollars and and, right. and, and a cool as fuck company. And if he wants to create ventilators in a day, he'll do it because he's got the productivity and all this stuff. But you don't know what the inside of Elon Musk's head is like when he goes to sleep on an Exactly. Night. You don't know the torment. You're the one, you know, that's my buddy just always would say to me, it would be like, you're the one inside your head, you know, it's, it's as simple as a voice in your head taunting you or, you know, like that is not healthy. Like most people, you would try to eliminate that voice of negativity or, or whatever it is that's not making you feel good. We want to feel good, right? But to some of these people, that voice is what fires them up. And that is not a good thing. And that doesn't make them a good person. We have a lot, we have this, this way of trying to fixate patterns on people uh, and we will make assumptions to make ourselves feel better at any cost. Assumptions that have absolutely zero basis in science or basis in the real world. Well, like this person can't cheat. He's a good person. Well, those are two different things. Those are two different things. Do you understand? This person can't take drugs. He's a, I've seen him. He's a good guy. What, the, why, those are not, those, you know, you can't say the grass is green because the sky is blue or whatever. That's not how that works. But we always want to make patterns like that because it's like, that's a struggle of human consciousness. We're always trying to find how we can make sense of this world. Here's, here's why I think this is touched on something I talk about a lot, that we think in archetypes. So we have these cultural memes that we're fed, especially when we're young, 
And then we try and slot people into these archetypes, the hero, the maiden, the villain, the redeemed, the, the hopeless case, you know, the nerd, the, the st- strong alpha, the silent guy, you know, all of these different things. And we try and slot people into this. Part of it is because we're lazy and it's because we don't want to have to do the work to work out, well, hang on, Zach's like got a, a bit of this, but he's also got like a bit of that in him and a little bit of this and that doesn't yeah. re- these two things don't really fit so i'm kind of going to forget about that and i'll just have him as the i'll pin him as the that guy you know yeah. it's like whatever the majority of your personality makeup is we'll just use that the best stories the best films are the ones that question that the, the best ones by far who do we root for who who's good who's bad what is good and what is bad what is morality what is immoral that those are the best stories. And it's really funny because in in Hollywood, like people still they're like, well, what's his thing? Like what what's his archetype? Is he the hero of the story? It's like well, why are we still why is that everyone's go to, even though we know the best stories are the ones that question those things? Think about like something as simple as like the Joker that just came out. Are we on Arthur Fleck's side or are we not? Are do you know who's good, who's bad? Is Murray bad? Is Murray good? We don't people like that that sort of stuff it it causes pain in people. I left that movie theater and I shit you not I looked around and I remember hearing conversations of girls and and guys everyone being like that fucking sucked. That movie sucked. That movie was depressing. I I I I'm so pissed I went and saw that movie. I walked out of that movie theater being like, that was one of the best movies I've ever sat down and watched ever. You know? Because I, when I go to something like that, I want... To, it it's helps. It's an exercise to question my surroundings, to question my world. When we want to go to the movie theater and hold up a big foam finger and get our popcorn and, you know, cheer on Vin Diesel and and the fast and the furious guys, like that's fine. But what happens is that sort of mindset carries over into all things culture. We want to deliver an ideology. We want to deliver a subset of things where we can fit people all the goddamn time. And it runs, it it runs amok. It, it, It kind of, it, it doesn't allow for, for nuance. That is my channel is based off of nuance, even though it's a simple thing where all I talk about is the snatch and the clean and jerk, right? If that's it, then I should have ended my channel two years ago. If it's just about those two things, there's no nuance there, but that is the, the goal of my style of coaching. My style of everything is to play with what is what is the answer nuance 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 always in between the lines always examining what has prior what what people have done what people have thought and examine uh what i have done and what i have thought and experiences i've had if we're not doing things like that then we're just going to keep in this cyclical bullshit uh, narrative, this structure that's always going to repeat itself over and over and over again. That it's, and in all honesty, that was all I did. I, I here is my structure. If anyone is listening to to how I made my YouTube channel, what it is, instead of saying, "Here's how you do the snatch. You do the snatch like this. You do the you do this. You do that." Thank you for watching. I was saying when you learn this thing. It's likely that this will happen, and it's likely that you'll be told to do this. What I have found through my own experimentation is that either of those could work uh, if done like this or this or this. Do you see the the variance in that? That right there, it has like, you know, offshoots of, of different routes. You can go different things. I want to empower the viewer, not tell them what to do. So... I continually will try to do that. When when I when someone wants me to to do a video on programming, I think what is the issue actually? I don't want to I don't want to write a program and say do this. 
I want to know what it is that most people do wrong and I want to fix it or, or offer suggestions on how you can fix it. And that's it. And then, and honest to God, I know I just went on like a huge rant, but that, that is the biggest without question part of my success. And I'm sure as far as your podcast goes, that's what you want to do too. You want to live in the nuance. That's what I'm here for, man. That's literally, that's what interests me. That's the reason that I have these conversations, you know, and I say, I've said it a million times. I'm going to say it again. If you are not having a conversation with a friend about a a concept that you are interested in for at least half an hour a week where your phones are outside of the room, then you are missing out on the opportunity to develop yourself. I think it's like, oh, well, I need to do my yoga this week or I need to do my mobility today or I need to go for a walk. I need to get my 10,000 steps. Once a week, you need to have a conversation with a friend that's not distracted by other things because it it sharpens your skills. It improves the precision of your thoughts, improves your ability to articulate things. Um, It could be with yourself, man. You could could record a monologue. You could, everyone's got a phone. I mean, I, I definitely talk to myself for sure. Like there's no question. And I know that might sound weird or whatever, but I sometimes I'll be walking the dogs and I'll just think out loud. Sometimes I'll just start talking and it it looks like I have schizophrenia, but, Mm -hmm. but realistically, like I, I couldn't agree more with, um, you know, did you ever see the documentary on Avicii? Yes. The, the, uh, The one on Netflix? Yeah. Okay. So there's the part where he says he's really interested in this article or maybe this study that's, that talks about, the type of introverts there are. And he's like, I'm kind of what you would call an extroverted introvert or something like that. And he's like, I am not interested in going out and partying, but I am very interested in being social and sharing ideas with people and very deep, meaningful discussion. So in that sense, being very sociable does not mean being an extrovert. Wanting to share ideas and wanting to talk about philosophy, talk about deeper things, that is an inherently, you know, it could be called an introverted thing, even though it it involves other people. I believe that I kind of fit into something like that. And ultimately, you could see during this documentary, he wants that the whole time. You know, when you have, when you're, that famous and making that much money for other people, those other people are going to treat you like a product there because they make money off of you. So at no point in any time, did anyone stop to talk politics with the man? And that's all he wanted to do. Talk politics, talk religion, talk philosophy. You know, my wife, her parents and their friends would get together and they would talk about politics, religion, and philosophy. The three things that at the dinner table with friends you are not supposed to talk about, right? They would have all of their friends come over and those are the three things that they would talk about. Because they, it's like, what are we then if we're just a system of bullshit that we just regurgitate to each other, right? I, I totally agree. At least a half hour a week. That's nothing, man. It's the, way, it's, is it's, it's the way to program it in. So here's another one for you. This is something you may not have heard of before. George McGill, who is the highest ever played episode. He's just a mate, just an, essentially a nobody. Highest ever played episode. More than Robert Greene, more than Aubrey Marcus, more than Dave Castro or Dan Bailey. Wow. Um, and it's just a conversation between me and him. And he brings up this idea, which is called high agency. He says it's the single most useful skill, the most powerful skill in the 21st century. It's a conversation about mental models and high agency is one of them. High agency is a, a ability for a person to enact change as they see fit within the world. And the way to work out who your friend with high agency or the highest agency friend that you have is, is to do this mental uh, exercise. I'm going to get you to do it now and I want to hear your answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So imagine that you are put into a foreign jail, let's say South America. You're put in South America jail somewhere, Panama, somewhere proper. Na- you, you can get fucked up. And um, you have to get out in 24 hours. Who do you call? You can call mm. one friend. Who's the person that you call? 
it's it's definitely going to be the person that is the most communicative, right? The most dependable person. Well, think about think about what they're going to be able to do. They they're not going to need anyone else. They're going to have incredible solidarity. They're going to be able to think laterally, orthogonally. They're going to be able to, as you say, they're going to manipulate things in terms of a social aspect. They're going to be likable. They're going to be able to think outside of the box. You know, all of these different all these different things. And right. the crucial the crucial thing is they do all of that in motion. So it's not that they can abstractly think about what they would do. It's the ability of someone, because there's tons of people that have great ideas. There's a mi- How many people have you heard that say, oh, I'd love to start a YouTube channel. Yeah, I, love- yeah. I really like doing video. People that say, man, I, I love act- conversations. Yeah. I love listening the- to podcasts. It's like, put it into motion. Yeah, the actionable person too is what, what matters. Who do you the think person that ring? gets shit done. Who would you ring? Uh, probably my buddy, Augie. He's uh, one of my longest and best friends he, he would answer and you know he would get a plan together in action like almost immediately for sure you know for sure no question um and i think you know that's it's interesting you say that uh my coach max he, he always says ideas are meaningless you know um ideas are, are absolutely meaningless it's the it's the what am i thinking what what kind of phrase am I thinking about? It's the actionable, oh God, capitalization. No, it's, uh, he, he always uses this as an example. Um, Uber as an idea is a great idea, but supposedly, and I don't know if this is completely true still, it's losing money as a company. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. Right. So it's not a good company. It's not. I mean, I'll be the first person to say that. If you're losing money, you're not a good company, right? Does that great idea, bad company? Yes. Okay. So his thing that Max says is, if you could, you would. That's it. If you could do it, wouldn't you do it? If you can sit there and criticize someone on the way that they're doing something. That would mean that you could do it. And if you could do it, wouldn't you fucking do it? That's a really you know? good way. That's a really, really good way to put it. You know, I'm sure it's that- as simple as it gets. So, <laughs> like a lot of people I did an episode with Dr. David Sinclair, um, Harvard Medical School, one of the fifty most influential health professionals on the planet. Immediately after Rogan had him, and then I had him. I'm just like, wow. some guy. I'm still just yeah. some guy. But yeah. I was even less of some guy. A year, a year and a half ago. Anyway, um, and I started getting all of these things. Um, like, why didn't you ask him questions about this? Why didn't you chase him up on the fact that he's doing? I'm like, why don't you ask him on your podcast? Yeah. Oh, that's wait. right. You don't have one. Yeah. So, so here's okay. Here's um another one. And again, I Max Max Ada. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a pretty famous American weightlifting coach. Everyone should check him out. But he's definitely a big influence on me. Um, and, uh, he, he, there's three category, three criteria for what makes you a good weightlifting coach is what have you done yourself? What have you done with others? And what sort of education have you taken on to make yourself better? These are things that are always moving. You will never be a good coach in the sense that you can't get better. So you people can think of you being good as relative to other people or relative to other things, but you'll never be a good solidified coach. You always have to be evolving. But what have you done can mean what, what have you lifted And from what point have you lifted this and lifted that? So your improvement over this amount of time, have you, can you, can you show it to me? Skin in the game. Yes. With others. Now this is a broader one, but again, you could always think you have taken athlete A and you have brought them where? Show me exactly where the fuck you did that. Where did that athlete get better? And I need to see it. Okay. Or... Uh, what coach have you taken under your wing? What sort of, who can vouch for you? Who could I talk to and say, you know what? That's a fucking good coach. Who, who can do that? That's, 
It's your relationship with others. And the final one is education. What are you currently doing to be a better coach through things that aren't maybe lifting related? To be a better person, to be a better, you know, father, husband, you know, boyfriend, whatever it is. Uh, what are you doing? How are you educating yourself? It could be, you know, you you go and you find a mentor. You you go and you visit someone and you have a podcast with them. Like those are educational moments. Those are things for growth. And if you can't provide me with those three things in any light, you are not you are not doing a good job of proving yourself in whatever field that is. What have you done? What have you done with others? And what the fuck is your education or how are you educating yourself? And some people I'll say, what have you done? And they'll be like, I don't have anything. Yeah, okay. So why are we having this discussion? It, random internet commenter who thinks they know fucking better. You know, this is another thing too, is, the people that are the quickest to talk shit to me or talk about me or about anyone are the last people to be doing it themselves. I, When I go to these weightlifting meets, I see the same coaches, the same lifters at every single one of them. And I'm so happy to see them. They're always there. And the people that that comment, that talk shit, that create the most noise are never there, ever. It's as simple as that. Show up. Just show up. Just show up. Be a part of it if you want to fix it. That you know, it's like it's like in any Americans and I'm sure people from the UK love complaining about politics on their Facebook or whatever. They but they'll never ever do anything about it. Ever. Ever ever ever. You know? It's just it's it's shit like that is is mind-boggling to me i think it becomes particularly you know? it becomes particularly irritating to somebody like yourself or you know anyone that's listening it doesn't you, you know us fucking children of the 21st century with our newfangled youtubes and instagram podcast profiles and all this shit like it doesn't matter about that but there's people that are listening who have high agency that are just great mums great brothers great you know, yes. em employees, great managers, great directors of companies, whatever it might be. Like there's still people that have that high agency that still are in motion, right? They're doing stuff. But you're right. The, it's the, the same people who always tend to comment, but don't ever put it into action. And th there's something particularly triggering about that in a way. It's, it's weakness. But it's, it's, it makes you feel, um, you, it's gobsmacked. You're like, that guy, that guy said that thing. That guy, well, that yeah, guy and, said it. What, how, did, how did he say it? You know, like, so why? Even still, like, even still, I try to avoid even, like, the simplicity of getting upset with a, by a commenter. What I like to know is, the, you look at the huge picture around that. Why are they commenting and what are they not doing? What is, what is the process that we are in as a society that allows this type of shit, you know? Because like you said, there's a lot of people out there listening who are fucking awesome people. And when I see someone who kicks ass as a father, who kicks or, or kicks ass as a mother, a brother, just kicks ass as a fucking person and doesn't have – any followers or anything like that, like crazy going on. They're just good people. Like I have more respect for them than anyone that it, 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 there's no separation. I don't give a shit who you are. If you can prove to me those things, like I love you as a person and I will always and forever. The person though, that like the first thing they think about is complaining with no action that is, like you said, in gobsmacked. I don't know. That's kind of a, a non-American term. <laughs> it might be a, it's where your jaw hits the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you, it, it, that is the shit that is insane to me. And it's way, way too common. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, you post, uh, you post something. The first thing I want to think about is what's a negative comment I can put to that? What's wrong about this? And I'm going to post it immediately. It's so really everyone weird because I... I I don't think, except for Brian Rose from London Real, who looks like a cod out of water and I dislike intensely, um, except for him, 
I I don't think I've ever said anything bad about anyone on the internet. And my my, my vendetta for Brian Rose aside, like that's it. I, I and I don't understand people who go out of their way to say anything bad. Like let's say that you put up, let's say your next video. I'm sure yeah, it be, won't be. because you wouldn't, you wouldn't. But let's you say, wouldn't let's fucking say your next, do it if let, you had anything <laughs> in the game. If you like you said skin in the game, you wouldn't fucking do it. But let's say that your next video sucks. I'm sure it won't. But let's say that your next video sucks. And we're still Don't be chatting. so sure. Don't be so sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, um, I'm not gonna co- uh, even if whether I know you or whether I don't, I'm not gonna comment and say this video's shit. I might comment and say, hey man, um, like get what you're trying to do here, but really don't think this is your best work. Perhaps you should, perhaps this would be a real cool way to, to try and redo this. And you'd read and go, that would hit, hit you a lot harder. It's weirdly. Like if someone messages and sends me something where they tell me the thing that I know that was true about an episode. Can, yeah, yes. I'm if like, you deliver a nuanced approach, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. That hurts, hurts way more. Yeah. yeah. So bad. But For you know, sure. I've never gone out of my way. I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to just waste my time having random internet arguments with stranger people. You know, I'm looking at my my phone here because I want to point out one of one of these people. Um, Let's give him a shout out. Yeah, you know, because this is the damage that people do, especially with this, you know, with the COVID nineteen thing. Um, there's a lot of fucking damage that can be done with shitty commenting, a lot, um, and there's no punishment for it. There's no being held accountable. So this guy goes, I basically. When shit really started hitting the fan with the virus, I basically was like, hey, guys, you know, it sucks. The gym is shut down and it sucks a lot for us, for the people who the gym is a big part of their identity. Like, I I do think it's a big deal that the gyms are shut down. Most people are like, yeah, the gym, you know, it's just a place. It's like for me, that's my life. Like I spent so much time in there. It is a big deal. Um, But we have to do these things for public safety, you know. That's it. That's your social, you know, you, you, your accountability as a person in society. This guy goes, in my opinion, the statement that shutting down gyms is necessary for safety is one of the most asinine absurdities I can recall. In regard to the overall risk, this is one of the most mild viruses in centuries. Really, people, wake up. Quit mindlessly believing everything you're told and check the facts. This was three weeks ago. Okay, well, we'll get to how idiotic that is. I just responded. I said, really? One of the most asinine absurdities you can recall. Speaking in hyperbole against something you believe is hyperbolic is oh so funny to me. Right. So using hyperbole to speak against something. hyper, And then he goes, he responds. You've been alive long enough to remember several outbreak breaks through the years. Which one was less dangerous? Which one had a lower mortality rate? How many gyms do you remember closed for that outbreak? The answer to all of them is none. I love your content, but that statement is, uh, but making that, sorry, I'm glad you're going to continue making it, but that statement to placate, to be politically correct or whatever is, in my opinion, asinine absur- absurdity. Now, mind you, this was three weeks ago, and I already knew this guy was a total dipshit. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, the amount of people that have died in, in the U.S. alone from COVID-19 surpassed an entire year of swine flu, which is the next one. Right. So directly here is a more violent virus. Right. This is a very violent virus. Like it, I'm, I'm, and that's not to make people panic, but it is what it fucking is. We're not doing this because of some conspiracy theory. Right. And his thing was, he said back, he goes, he's like, you're right. It's officially more dangerous than swine flu. I stand corrected. Given the overall ineffectiveness of our attempts to flatten the curve, do you still believing that mandatory shutting down of gyms was necessary for safety? And I just simply said, yes. And he goes, fair enough. Right? So maybe he conceded, Man, right? That's a rare, that is a rare right. human but, on the internet. But three weeks ago is when we needed fucking shit faces like that to not sh- say shit like that. Three weeks ago was when it mattered. 
the, that's the point of this disease is that it takes time to develop. You can be asymptomatic for a long period of time, right? So, so three weeks ago when people are like, this is bullshit, this is an asinine absurdity. And then now they're like, you know what? I was wrong. It's like, no, that you can't do that. Your words mean things. If someone read that comment, I know that this is crazy and it probably didn't happen. But if someone read that and was like, you know what? Yeah, fuck it. And they, by chance, were an asymptomatic carrier and they brought the virus somewhere else. That is how the, that's how words can affect culture and not being held accountable to anything you say, not being held actionable to the words that you say is the ultimate plague. It, it plagues us as a society. So when someone sees something and their immediate thought is, I'm going to complain about it, but I'm not going to do a goddamn thing to change it, they are the problem, not the solution, always. Man, I couldn't agree more. There's a, a blog post that I keep on referencing. It's got the worst clickbaity title by David Wong, but it's had like 14 million hits, blog post, 14 million hits. And it's called Six Harsh Truths That Will Make You a Better Person. And essentially one of them, the main one, is that you are what you produce nothing else. So he's talking about, as a good example, he's saying um, you're a, a single guy who complains maybe about not getting girls. And this this archetype could be used for anything. I am a this that doesn't get this. And you say, well, I don't really understand because I'm really nice and I'm kind and I'm caring and I, I, I turn up on time and I always hold the door open for her and I do this and I do that. And they're like, right, so fucking what? Like, there is a guy, that's just the entry price that you pay to be a good human, to get in the game. There is a guy out there who has all of the things that you've just described, and he can play the fucking guitar. Yep. And you're like, okay, <laughs> and he can play the guitar. And that that stuck with me because it, it gets us away from this cycle, the, uh, the recycling of information, the recycling of existing talents and skills, routines, mindsets, all of the things that we do. And trying to break that wheel, as cons- obviously breaking it in the correct direction as opposed to making it worse because you can break your habits and, and replace them with worse ones. But trying to do that, you know, like that's the, the um, yeah. learning element of your, the learning and the personal element of your um, weightlifting trio. And then you've got the transcendent element, which is the one that's in the middle, which is to do with m- making other people better. That's how Others, you transcend. Yeah. So, you yeah. have, so I, I don't know, man. I think, I, I think th- there's a lot, there's an awful lot there. And I think we, well, pr- knowing, just knowing the lowest common denominator. So people always talk about hard work. And I'm someone who questions that idea of hard work because hard work is relative. And a lot of times hard work is the lowest common denominator, right? If smart work, talent, those are things that are needed. You know, um, hard work. So, so here's a good example. I can get to the gym. And I'm going to work to, I'm going to fucking work harder than anyone. Well, if I'm not smart about it, that hard work doesn't mean shit. I, I get, take a maximum back squat and unrack it and say, I'm going to back squat this. Tell me you're not working hard. It's impossible to not work hard when you're back squatting. It's impossible. You put it, you put all the weight you can on your back and you're like, fuck, this is heavy. That's hard work, but it's not going to make you better. You know, unless you know what you're doing with it. So it's this culture of hard work wins, hard work wins. It's like, no, that's not, it's not ever the case. That's the lowest common denominator. That's the price, the entry price you have to pay to get through. Yeah. There's someone that's working hard and is really good at the guitar, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. And they're recovering and the nutrition's right. And they're helping to uh, transcend what they do by bringing other people up, which then brings their game up even further. And they're yeah. doing the continuous prof- professional development and learning. And Man, I get it. Look, I've, Zach, I feel like we could go on for uh, for all night, man. I'm going to have to get you on again so we can keep this conversation going. But look, tell yeah, uh, tell everyone where they can go, where they should head to check you out. So first and foremost, YouTube channel, just search Zach, Z-A-C-K, Tellender, T-E-L-A-N-D-E-R. And then um, if you 
you want to follow me on Instagram, coach underscore ZT. Uh, I also have $1 program for, for weightlifting. So I have $1 no programming. I yeah. On my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Zach Tellender. And, you know, if you want to start weightlifting, you can just click one of those programs, download it. And there you go. It also just supports me and my endeavors. You know, I, I use the money from that Patreon to go like fly to meets. I, it was cool. Like my, my last Patreon check paid for my, uh, going to the Arnold and, uh, paying for all of my expenses there to, to coach to literally just for, for my job. So it was, it was really awesome. That's sick. And that's it. Awesome. I love it. Everything will be linked in the show notes below. Of course, uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, you know what to do. Go and head on Zach's channel. Give him some, uh, give him some love. Maybe try and find that comment of someone who doesn't know what they're talking about to do with coronavirus. Like, share, and subscribe. If you've enjoyed this episode, give me a message wherever you follow me. But for now, Zach, man, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. <laughs>